Stories, fables, ghostly tales. Welcome, listeners, to your Monday morning, or for some of you, Monday evening, Sherlock Holmes episode. Now, unfortunately, today I'm actually pretty sick. Spent since Friday last week recovering from sore throats, muscle aches, endless coughing, and uh, a temperature. The price you pay when working in an office environment. People still come to work when they're sick, and it just pushes the air around. Six weeks being in that environment, and my immune system finally cocked it. Anyway, good news is I'm on the mend and should be back to full strength Wednesday. So my apologies up front for this intro being quite short, and no outro as I need to give my voice a rest. I just want to say a huge thank you to my Patreons that support me. And I'm so grateful to have your ongoing monthly support. And now let's look at today's episodes. First up is A Scandal in Bohemia. A story where even Holmes, dare I say, is fooled. And your second remastered episode is The Accidental Murderess. Where a woman from Holmes' past appears to him again. Where their personal history almost gets in the way of the case being ruined. Okay, now, it's time to rest my vocals. Have a lovely evening, folks, or have a brilliant start to your morning. I'll join you Wednesday for some folk stories or creepy tales, whichever takes my fancy. And as always, till next we meet, enjoy. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're quite muffled up tonight, I see. Overcoat, scarf, and gloves. Slip them off and come and join me by the fire. Thanks, Doctor. It's quite a nip in the air tonight. Yes, there is indeed. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's story centered around the activities of a brilliant and beautiful woman. Yes, my boy. Her name was Irene Adler. But I never knew Holmes referred to her by any other name than the woman. <laughs> she sounds mighty intriguing. How did you happen to meet up with her? Well, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. One night, it was on the 20th of May in 1888, to be exact, I was returning home from a visit to a patient when my steps led me through Baker Street. Since my marriage, I haven't seen much of Sherlock Holmes. And and you couldn't uh, resist stopping by at 221B, I'm sure, Doctor. <laughs> of course I couldn't. As I stood outside the well-remembered door, I looked up at the lighted windows and saw the tall, spare figure of my old friend. Passed twice in dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk on his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew every mood of his and habit of his, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was hot on the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell, and a few moments later, found myself standing before him. You're looking splendid, Chief. Yes, Holmes, I'm feeling very well, thanks. And in practice again, I see. You didn't tell me that you'd gone back into harness. Oh, then how did you know? Elementary, my dear chap. If a gentleman walks into my rooms, smelling of iodoform, with uh, a black mark of nitrate of silver on his right forefinger, and a bulge on the left side of his hat, to show where he's uh, secreted his stethoscope, I should be dull indeed if I didn't pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. <laughs> Just the same as ever, Holmes. By the way, I'm... Uh... Not interrupting you, are well, you? are, old fellow, but it's, um, it's a most welcome interruption. You're working on a new case? Um, it looks like it. This letter arrived by the last post today. It's undated and has neither signature nor address. Read it. Uh, let's have a look. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted. This account of you we have from all quarters received. Uh, be in your chamber, then, at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. It's got it. It's all very mysterious. What do you imagine it means? Look carefully at the note, old fellow. What do you deduce from it? Well, now, let me think. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Such paper couldn't be bought under half a crown a packet. And it's peculiarly... Strong and, and stiff. Peculiar. That's the very word. It's not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. Don't you notice anything? Yes. It's a large E with a small G and and a large G with a small T. That's right. Woven into the texture of the paper. What does that suggest to you? 
The name of the maker, no doubt, or perhaps his monogram. Not at all, my dear fellow. The G with the small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is the German for company. And the E-G? That stands for Igria. You do? It's a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad. Oh, so the paper was made in Bohemia? Undoubtedly, my dear fellow. And the man who wrote the note is a German. How do you know that? Observe the curious construction of the sentence, This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a Russian could not have written that. It's the German who is so discourteous to his verbs. Oh, there's your count now. I, I, I better go home. No, 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 unless you have to. Well, I, I could stay. I thought that Ben, you... stay, old chap. I'm lost without my Boswell, and this promises to be interesting. I, um, I told Mrs. Hudson to let the masked visitor come upstairs unannounced. Come in. Good evening, sir. You received my note? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in, won't you? And sit down. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. You may say anything before him that you can say to me. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as uh, Count von Kram. How do you do, sir? You must excuse this mask that I wear. Uh, the august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you. And uh, I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I'm well aware of that fact, sir. You see, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, the matter I am about to discuss... Uh, implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of uh, Bohemia. That has not escaped me either, sir. In fact, if you will state your case, I shall be the better able to advise you. Your Majesty. Uh, how did you... Yes. Yes, I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed. I shall remove the mask. There. Mr. Holmes... I have traveled incognito from Prague for the express purpose of consulting. Then pray consult. Briefly, the facts are these. Some five years ago, uh, during a visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. Irene Adler? We know of her, Your Majesty. Uh, look her up in the index for me, will you, Watson? Uh, it's right beside you on the desk there. I uh, imagine that the name would not be unfamiliar Here to you. Here we are. A. Abraham's Acton Green Hatchet Murders. Adler. Adler. Splendid. Adler. Splendid, old fellow. Hand me the file, will you? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Irene Adler, born in New Jersey in the United States in 1858, Contralto. Mm -hmm. Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Mm -hmm. Retired from the operatic stage, living in London. Quite so. And here's a recent notation. Uh huh. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so, but how did... Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? No. Then I fail to follow, Your Majesty. If this young lady should produce her letters for blackmailing purposes, how should she prove their authenticity? There is the handwriting. Well, that could be a forgery, Your Majesty. But it was private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. What? They were bought. In the photograph. Oh, dear, oh, dear. That's very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. Oh, did you inscribe the photograph, Your Majesty? Uh, yes, Dr. Watson, I'm afraid I did. Oh, uh, Mr. Holmes, it must be recovered. Perhaps if you were to pay enough, the photograph might be bought. She refuses to sell. Oh, stolen, then. Uh, five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked our house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. Oh, dear. That's quite a pretty little problem. Uh, it is a deadly serious one to me. Your Majesty, what does Miss Adler intend to do with the photograph? To ruin me. Oh, how? Well, I, uh, I'm about to be married to the second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. She is the soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct could bring the matter to an end. Mm. And Irene Adler threatens to send the photograph to your fiancé, I suppose. Yes, and she will do it. Rather than let me marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. Are None. you sure that she's not already sent it, Your Majesty? I am sure. Now, why, Your Majesty? She said uh, that she would send it on the day my betrothal is publicly announced. That day will be next Monday. Splendid. Then we have still um, three days yet. Uh, Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly. You will find me at the Langham Hotel, registered as uh, Count von Kram. Just two questions before you leave, sir. But are they? Is the photograph large or small? Quite large. And uh, it was in a heavy frame. I see. And what is Miss Irene Adler's London address? We only lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Uh, thank you, Your Majesty. Good night, and I trust we shall soon have some good news for you. I am placing all my hopes in you, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Good night, Dr. Watson. Uh, good night, Your Majesty. 
Fascinating problem, Holmes. I, I wish I could help you with it. You can, my dear chap. Huh? I shall be glad of your company. Oh, splendid. Uh, what's our first move, Holmes? Well, a good night's rest, I think. We'll meet here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then? And then, my dear fellow, we will see what we can find out about Miss Irene Adler. Late of the Warsaw Imperial Opera Company and at present residing at Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. <laughs> Well, Holmes, a cursory examination of Brownie Lodge didn't prove very illuminating. No, a bijou residence that represents the essence of dignified suburbia that tells us very little about its owner. I think a visit to the local public house might prove more instructive. Come on, old chap. I see the door to the coach and horses inviting us from across the road. Well, our disguises shouldn't cause any suspicion, Holmes. That's why I suggested them. In the character of a couple of stable hands... I felt that we might inspire confidence. This is a horsey neighborhood. There's a wonderful sympathy and freemasonry among the fraternity. There we are. Better let me do most of the talking. Yes, I will indeed. I'm sure that your accent will be more convincing than mine. Let's go in, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> What'll it be, mateys? Half a bowl and more, please. Uh, how about you, Charlie? All ever say? Yeah. Two halves of bowl and more. <laughs> well, here you are, mateys. That'll be a tenner. Uh, have a drink with us, Governor. Oh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> I'll have a Guinness. You, uh, blokes new round here? Yes, that's right. Come over from Clapham. Clapham, eh? Um, <laughs> well, here's looking at you. Ah. <clears throat> Hunting for jobs? That's right. Uh, we was told that Miss Adler, across at Bryony Lodge, needed a new coachman and a groom. Well, it's the first time I've heard of it. It might be true. Uh, uh, have you been over there to ask? No, not yet. We thought we'd find out something about the old girl first. <laughs> she ain't no old girl, matey. <laughs> She's the prettiest young thing you ever saw under a bonnet, and that's a fact. You know her, Governor? Why, of course I know her. Used to drive her carriage, I did. Uh, uh, for I uh, can't work here. Oh, what's she like? Oh, nice little lady, as you'll find, Jim. A work yard? No, no, no. She, uh, she lives quiet, like... Uh, goes out uh, singing at concerts once in a while. The rest of the time, it's money for Jim. She goes out for a drive in the park every day at five and comes back to dinner at 6.30. Uh, the rest of the time's your own. She ain't married, you say? No, no. But uh, she's got a bloke what comes to see her all the time. Uh, he's a barrister. Nice gentleman. Uh, Mr. Geoffrey Norton is his name. Good-looking fella. Uh, wouldn't be surprised to see him get spliced. <laughs> Sounds like a cushy job to me. Come on, Charlie. Let's get out of the house and see what's what. Much obliged to you, chum. Well, <laughs> good luck, mateys, and, <laughs> and thanks for the dinners. What's our next move, Holmes? Let's stroll back to Brownie Lodge. I'm undecided whether to continue my investigation there or to try and find out something about Mr. Jeffrey Norton, the barrister. If he's just her lawyer and nothing else, it's more than likely that she's entrusted the photograph to his safekeeping. Uh, hello. There's a cab waiting outside Miss Adler's house. Hurry, Watson. Maybe Mr. Norton's. Here, here we are at the gate. Yes. Here comes a man hurrying down the pathway. Quick. Flatten yourself behind this post. Listen. Where to now, Mr. Norton? Drive like the devil. First to Gross and Hankies in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica in the Edgeware Road. Half a sovereign if you do it in 20 minutes. Right, Charles, Mr. Norton, off in. Fire and signal the cab, Watson. We must follow him. Well, here comes one. Oh, no, it isn't. It's, it's a private carriage. It's hardless, no doubt. Here she comes down the pathway. Back behind the post again, Watson. Where to, Miss Adler? The Church of St. Monica's, John. And half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. The game's afoot, Watson. Quick. We must get a cab and follow them. Here comes a hansom. Hi, cabby, cabby. Here. You blokes got enough money to take a cab? Here's a half sovereign for you, my man. Right you are. Where to, Governor? The Church of St. Monica. In the Edgware Road. And another half sovereign for you if you get us there in 20 minutes. <laughs> The 
Did uh, you and Sherlock Holmes reach that church inside the 20 minutes? Yes, Mr. Bartell, we did, but the other carriages were there before us. Holmes went into the church after telling me to guard the outside. I must have waited for 10 minutes or more before Mr. Jeffrey Norton and Miss Adler came out, spoke a few words to each other, and then left in their separate conveyances. A moment later, Holmes, still dressed as a stable hand, came striding out of the church and down the steps towards me. He was obviously very excited. What? What? Are they left? Yes, in separate cabs. I overheard him say that he was going back to his office, and she said I shall drive out to the park and, at five this evening. Splendid, old fellow. Then come on, we can return to Baker Street. Uh, what happened inside the church? Home? They were married. Married? Of course. The ceremony would have been illegal if it had been performed after noon. That accounted for their wild dash to the church. Jump into the cab. Where to now, Governor? 221 B Baker Street. Oh, so they, they got married, eh? Yes, and it may amuse you to know that I acted as witness at the ceremony. Oh, you did? But how did that happen? Their, their own witness that failed to appear and I was dragged into the breach. The uh, bride gave me this sovereign as a memento. I uh, think I'll wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. What an amazing situation. Things begin to look better for the king, don't they? Yes. Now that she's Mrs. Norton, the chances are that she won't want to expose his majesty after all. I hope so, Watson. I hope so. But we can't afford to take any chances. I think the time is right for us to come to closer grips with the lady. Well, Holmes, now that we've eaten, perhaps you'll tell me your plan. With pleasure, my dear fellow. And while I'm so doing, I'll proceed with applying the makeup for my new disguise. Another disguise? What's it to be this time? I think the character and appearance of an amiable and simple-minded nonconformist clergyman would be most suited to my plan for entering Miss Adler's house. Are you going to try and enter, then? I must, dear fellow. Yes, huh? I'm sure the photograph is there. Miss Adler, or rather Mrs. Norton, will return from her drive and park at 6.30. We must be at Bryony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I've already made my arrangements. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may, you understand? I'm to remain neutral. Yes, there will be some small unpleasantness. Don't join in it. Lend him my being conveyed into the house. As soon as I'm able to, I shall open one of the windows. You are to watch from the outside. When I raise my hand, you will throw an object which I shall give you through the window and at the same time cry fire. Follow me? Entirely, but what am I to throw? Oh, it's nothing very formidable. Here it is. Huh, looks like a great big cigar. What is it? Just an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket, fitted with a cap at each end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to throwing it through the window. When you raise the cry fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. We then walk to the end of the street, and I'll rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope I've made myself clear. Perfectly. Good. And now, old fellow, as soon as I've done my clerical attire, let's be on our way. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> Nearly 6.30, Holmes. We've been pacing up and down in front of her house for half an hour now. I hope she does come back. I'm sure she will. There seem to be a lot of loafers hanging around her gate. All part of my conspiracy, old chap. You'll see them play their parts in a few minutes. You still think the photograph is inside the house? Yes, I'm sure of it. Hmm? It's most unlikely that she carries it about with her. Remember, the king told us it was a, a large frame picture. And also remember but she planned to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands on it. It must be inside her house. But her house has been burgled twice. They don't know how to look. Well, how will you look? I won't. I'll get her to show me. She'll refuse. Well, she won't be able to... Shh. Get up the carriage now. Remember, Watson, carry out my orders to the letter. Yes, you can trust me, huh? Limey, here comes the Duchess of Tiddlewinks. Let's put out the carpet. She might get her tootsies wet. Oh, put her sock in it, Elfie. Leave him alone. She's no better than she ought to be. Please let me through. I live here. Well, ain't that nice? We'll all come in and have a cup of cocoa. <laughs> Move out of the way, please, and let the lady through. Mind your own business. Just because your collar's turned the wrong way, you can't spoil our fun. That's right, Eddie. Keep your nose out of it, parson. Please don't fight about it. I tell you to stop molesting the lady. Do ya? Then how would you like a biff in the nose? <laughs> oh, he hit the poor man. Then he ran away, the coward. Is the clergyman badly hurt? He hit his head, Mum, and he fell. If you ask me, he's hurt bad. He's bleeding something terrible. Can we bring him in, Mum? He can't lie here in the street. Why, of course. Bring him in. Right you are, Mum. Here, Bert. Right out. Give us a hand. Uh, anyway, uh, uh. Oh, poor fella. 
Do you see what happened to him, mister? Yes, I saw my good woman. A very convincing demonstration. What do you mean? Uh, weren't you paid by a, a certain gentleman for this performance? Oh, Yen knows about it, too. Yeah, you must be a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, um, I am. Nice gentleman. He give us five bob a piece for tonight's work. It ain't through yet, though. We got to start yelling fire when somebody tells us. I'm that somebody, my dear lady. There's Mr. Holmes now. He's inside the house. Yes, he's up near the window. Now he's raising his hand. That's my signal. Now to throw the rocket. Uh, there we are. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Holmes, there you are. You have the photograph? No. But I know what it is. She showed me as I told you she would. I'm still in the dark. There's no mystery, old chap. When my accomplices started the round the street, I had a little moist red paint in my hand. As my good friend Alfie pretended to strike me, I clapped my hand to my head and fell down. It's an old trick. Yes, I understand that, but uh, how did my throwing the rocket help you? It was all important, my dear fellow. When a woman thinks her home is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing she values most. A married woman grabs her baby, an unmarried, reaches for her jewel box. In this case, of course, it was the photograph. Well, where was it? In a recess in the living room, just above the right-hand bell pole. I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I made it known that the fire was a false alarm, she replaced the photograph. As soon as I was able, I assured her that I was feeling well enough to leave. You didn't take the photograph, then? No, I felt that... Uh, over-precipitance at this stage might ruin everything. And what do we do now? Drive to the Langham Hotel and inform His Majesty of what has happened. Then return with him here. And after that, my dear chap, the case will be ended. This is Barney Lodge now, Your Majesty. Yes, I'm all impatience. Your certain this photograph will still be there, Mr. Holmes. I have every reason to believe so, Your Majesty. Mm, I, I must confess, uh, this is going to be something of an ordeal. And I suggest that you let me do the talking, Your Majesty. I think I know how to handle the lady. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. Uh, yes, I am Mr. Holmes. How did you know? My mistress told me that you would be likely to call. She has left for the continent with her husband. You mean she's left England? Never to return. Uh, then the papers, the photograph. Uh, all is lost, Mr. Holmes. We'll soon see. Follow me. She said you'd been looking for something. I hope you find it. This was the bell call. There's a sliding panel behind it somewhere. Ah, here it is. Uh, it's... Uh, it's the photograph there, Mr. Holmes. There is a photograph, but it's a photograph of the lady alone. Uh, here's a letter, and it's addressed to me. Well, what does it say, Holmes? My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. Until after the fire alarm, I had no suspicion. But then, when I realized how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I'd been warned that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. May I congratulate you on your disguise as the dear old clergyman? Great Scott, you were far more clever than you thought, Holmes. Uh, yeah, yeah, go on. What else does it say? Uh, let me see. My husband and I both thought that the best recourse was flight. So you will find the nest empty. As to the photograph of the king and yourself, his majesty may rest in peace. Thank goodness for that. I love and am loved by a better man than he. Hmm. I leave another photograph, however that he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay Adler. What a woman, Watson. What a woman. What a magnificent woman. She fooled me completely. But, uh, oh, I... I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I, I've been unable to bring your business to a more successful conclusion. <laughs> On the contrary, my dear sir, nothing could be more successful. I know that Irene's word is inviolate. The incriminating photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. I'm glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Now, pray tell me in, in what way I can reward you. This uh, barrel uh, ring that I wear, <laughs> I should be proud Your majesty to. has something that I should um, value even more highly. You have but to name it. This photograph. Irene's photograph? But certainly. 
However, you must let me give you something more substantial. Oh, no, 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 Your Majesty. This is uh, something I shall treasure all my life. This and a golden sovereign I received from the lady's hand. They will remind me that I was once tricked by a woman. A woman that I shall never forget. <laughs> What a woman, that Mrs. Adler. Or should I say, Mrs. Norton. Ah, that's the kind of woman I could really go for, Doctor. Yeah, you could. Just between ourselves, you know, I sort of, uh, well, uh, I sort of could go, go for her myself. <laughs> she was intelligent. Yeah, she was rich. Beautiful. That's the kind of woman you want sitting next to you in front of a cozy fire on a nippy fall night. Just the three of you. The three of you? Mm-hmm. You, she... And a glass of Petri Port. Mr. <laughs> Why not? That Petri California Port is some wine. Well, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine, all right. And no wonder. Look at all the experience they've had. Ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, the Petri family has handed down from father to son, from father to son, the art of selecting perfect sun-ripened California grapes and making them into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on the label of every bottle of Petri wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. If you've bought a victory bond, you're welcome. I have, Doctor. Take equal parts of beautiful English countryside and black villainy. Mix them, add a dash of romance... A sprinkling of danger, seasoned well with the usual theatrical condiments, and you have the case of the accidental murderess. Sounds like a tasty dish. Uh, how did the story begin, Doctor? In 1895. Holmes had just concluded his famous investigation of the sudden death of Cardinal Tusker, an inquiry which was carried out at the express desire of his Holiness the Pope. And in consequence, the great man felt that a couple of weeks' rest in the heart of Warwickshire would be a pleasant change after our rather strenuous adventures in Italy. And so, Mr. Bartell, we went to Stratford-on-Avon. Oh, the home of Shakespeare, huh? Quite right, my boy. As a matter of fact, that was the reason that decided us to go there. Holmes was a great lover of the drama, you know. And at the time my story begins, the Shakespearean festival was in full swing. For the first week, life there was calm and peaceful. During the daytime, we visited the local places of interest, such as Anne Hathaway's cottage and Shakespeare's birthplace, and the evenings found us at the theater. It was on a Tuesday, I remember, during our second week's stay that the trouble began. Holmes and I had gone for a walk through the nearby forest of Avon. He was in unusually good spirits that morning, and there was a distant, distinct, I mean, as he, as he said, Watson, for once I begin to wish that I were a man of wealth. Oh, and <laughs> what makes you say that, Holmes? The beauty of this place, old fellow. I'm perfectly certain I'd be happy in retirement here. It's rather depressing to think that in a week or two, the sordid necessity of making money will demand my return to Baker Street in a world of criminals. No, I must say that in an environment like this, it is a little hard to think of crime. How does the old saying go? Where every prospect pleases, and only man is vile. Yes, but uh, Shakespeare puts it even better, old chap. Oh, really? What's he say? Well, surely you remember the speech in uh, As You Like It. We saw the production two nights ago. Oh, I don't remember the speech. How did it go? In this setting, it's really remarkably apposite. Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we but the penalty of Adam, the season's difference. Don't you remember? Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad ugly and venomous, wears yet precious jewel in his head. And this our life exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, Sermons and sins, and good in everything. I would not change it. Upon <laughs> my soul, you read that much from the fellow on the stage the other night. <laughs> Don't tell me I adopted the wrong profession, Watson. Oh, dear me, wait a minute. The path seems to end here. Nothing but dense trees ahead of us. There's another path over there. I think it leads down to the river. Then let's follow it. The Avon is always... <laughs> Great Scott, that was a... Ah. Holmes. Holmes, you hurt? Ah, uh, yes, I think I am. Bullet hit my shoulder. I think it's only grazed it. Well, get off your coat quickly. Let's have a well, look. It's only a scratch. First, let's find out where it was fired from. I heard the thud of, the thud of a bullet in the tree behind me. Yes, here we are. Give me a pen knife, old fellow, will you? 
There you are. Thanks. You suppose that that shot was deliberate? Well, I can't imagine someone mistaking me for a rabbit, Watson. Uh Uh-huh. Here's the bullet. Now, let me see. I was standing there. A line from this bullet hole in the tree through a spot where I was standing would indicate that the shot was fired from that cluster of trees over there. Come on, Watson. Let's see what a search discloses. I wish you'd let me look at that shoulder before you start galloping all over the countryside, Holmes. You're bleeding quite profusely. Oh, plenty of time to look at it when we... Hello. Look over there. A man and woman running towards us across the clearing. Yes, and carrying guns. Yes, it looks as if it was an accident yeah. after all. Was anyone hurt? Yes, sir. My friend was hit in the shoulder. Oh, how dreadful. It's not a bad wound, is it? Oh, it's only a scratch, madam. I, I hope. But you put the blood on your coat. Yeah, well, just, um... How did this, uh, well, this accident happen, sir? Well, we were out rabbit shooting. I was teaching my wife to use a rifle. Now, I, I saw a rabbit scurry across the clearing. I raised the rifle and fired. It seemed to me, Geoffrey, that as I did so, you jolted my arm. Yes, I'm afraid I did, Alice. I was going to fire too, but as I raised my rifle, I jolted your elbow and sent your shot wild. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am, sir. Uh, here, uh, here's my card. Of course, we'll take care of any expenses that may be entailed. Well, the first thing to do is to find out how much damage has been done. You'd better take your coat off, old fellow. I, uh, I, I don't, think, don't think I care. Oh, he, he's badly hurt. No, it, it's just that... Oh. Oh, the man's fainted. Oh, this is dreadful. Uh, I have a horse and trap down the road. Wait, will uh, I must get him to a hospital as, as fast as possible. Holmes, Holmes, are you feeling any better? Has the nurse gone? Yes, 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 she's bringing the house surgeon. And the uh, man and his wife? They're down in the hospital waiting room. Oh. I found out their name. It's it's Markham. Then we're alone. Yes, 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 old fellow. In that case, I can stop behaving as if I were at death's door. Holmes, you mean that you... You sham that collapse just now? <laughs> yes, yes, I did, Watson. Oh, well, this spare me a little pity, old chap. My shoulder is confoundedly painful, I assure you. Well, uh, I'm sure it is. But what made you pretend to faint? I recognize this, Mrs. Markham, and I think you recognize me. It's important she assume I'm out of action for a while. Oh? Mrs. Markham. Why? Well, Mrs. Markham is, uh, in reality, the notorious Mrs. Dangerfield. You remember the Dangerfield case? The Dangerfield? Great Scott, yes. She was tried for the murder of her husband by poisoning, wasn't she? Yes, she was, old fellow. She was acquitted. The jury decided he was an habitual arsenic addict who happened to take an accidental overdose. Well, didn't you have some connection with oh, yes, the case? Yes. It was I who tracked down the sale of the arsenic she claimed to have bought for cosmetic purposes. Well, if you ask me, that shot at you was no accident. Oh, of course it wasn't. I'm certain that I was recognized. In any case, her record is a bad one. Uh, prior to her husband's death, there was an episode in which her uncle was killed in a shooting accident on a grouse moor in Scotland. An uncle who left her a large fortune on his death. I suppose Mrs. Dangerfield was a member of the shooting party when the uh, accident happened. Uh, yes, she was. And she's something of a femme fatale, what? I must plan my actions very cautiously. I'm up against a dangerous opponent. Well, you'll have to stay in the hospital until your wound's being examined and dressed. That's too well. And while the local staff are taking care of that, I want you to shadow the Markham. Of course I will, Holmes. Stick close to them, old fellow. Make them believe that I'm going to be kept here for some days. Find out as much as you can, and then report to me. Right, I'll do my best. <laughs> it's, it's awfully kind of you, Mrs. Markham, to insist on having me back to your house for lunch. My dear Dr. Watson... After injuring the famous Mr. Holmes, it's the least I could do. Of course it is. <laughs> Jeffrey, dear, will you bring us some cheese day off, you know? Very really well, Alice. Uh, is anyone else coming to lunch? Only Dennis Bromley. Oh, Lord, that fellow seems to live here. Well, I'll go and get the sherry. Sit down, won't you, Dr. Watson? Oh, thank you, madam. Thank you. You, um, uh, you say that you think Mr. Holmes will be in the hospital for some days? I'm afraid so. The wound wasn't serious. He lost quite a bit of blood. Oh, I feel perfectly dreadful about it. Well, you mustn't blame yourself too much, madam. It was an accident. Yes, but I might so easily have killed him. Well, you haven't, and that's all that matters. Uh, did you say that uh, Dennis Romney was coming to lunch? Is that the actor fellow from the Memorial Theatre? Yes. Have you seen him on the stage? Yes, 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 several times. Holmes and I have been going to the festival regularly since we came down here. A fine actor, isn't he? 
A shame they give him such poor parts. Why, what did he do? Imagine him letting that frightful Basil Grant play Hamlet last night. And it's only played Laertes. <laughs> Dennis is three times a better actor. <laughs> he, uh, he's coaching me in acting. Oh, coaching you? Really? Yes, he thinks that I may be able to get small parts here next season. I've always had a great urge to go on the stage, but no one's ever encouraged me before. Oh, here's Jeffrey. This sherry is rather special, Doctor. Perez de la Frontière, only a few bottles left. Oh, it's very nice of you, sir. Oh, that must be Dennis. I'll go let him in. Yeah, we might as we might as well have a drink. You'll find it'll help making this actor fellow more tolerable. I take it, Mr. Markham, that you're not an admirer of Mr. Dennis Romney. Don't bear him. He's always quoting Shakespeare and behaving generally as if he were another Irving. <laughs> He's got Alice completely fooled. Here's <laughs> a glass, Doctor. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Dennis, I want to introduce you to Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Romney? How do you do, sir? Hello, Jeffrey. Uh, want a glass of sherry? Uh, thanks. That'd be very nice. Are you a disciple of the theatre, Dr. Watson? Well, hardly a disciple, sir, but I've been attending the festival during the last week. I enjoyed your performances immensely, if I may say so. Oh, you may say so, Doctor. Here's your sherry, Dennis. Oh, don't be caught, Jeffrey. And please remember that Dennis is our guest. Oh, it's all right, Alice. I know that Jeffrey's bark is a good deal worse than his bite. <clears throat> and, uh, and what play are you appearing in tonight, Mr. Romney? King Lear. I shall once again portray the thankless role of the King of France. <laughs> While that incredibly bad actor, Basil Grant, tears a multitude of passions to tatters in his rendition of Lear. Oh, horrible, horrible, most horrible. I thought his Hamlet was atrocious last night. Wasn't it? When he came to his final line, the rest is silence as much as I could do to prevent cheering. Yeah, I felt rather the same way when you were killed in the duel, Dennis. Oh, Jeffrey, <laughs> you're being intolerably rude. Why don't you take Dr. Watson upstairs and show him your butterfly collection? Then at least you'll know what you're talking about. Are you interested in butterflies, Doctor? I, I have quite a rare collection. Oh, really? I'd like to see them very much. Come on, then. Uh, I think we've just got time before lunch. Try and bring yourself down a few better manners, Jeffrey, dear. I'm really quite an easygoing man, Doctor, but the arrogance of that fellow Romney infuriates well, me. Oh, I must say, he does seem to have rather a good opinion of himself. Don't, uh, don't put too much weight on that balcony rail. It's absolutely full of wormholes. Uh, part of the attraction of an old house, my wife tells me. <laughs> but I regard it as confoundedly dangerous. Yeah, and this is my little museum. In these cases, I think you'll find some of the finest specimens of Lepidoptera you've ever seen. It's my hobby, and I may say that, with the exception of the Natural History Museum, I doubt if you'll find a finer collection. It must have taken you years to collect them. Well, it has. Many years, many disappointments, and a great deal of patience. <laughs> Look at this fellow. He's my prize specimen, a North American monarch. North American monarch? Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, isn't he? And this is an admiral, yes, of course very I know him. rare. And this is a perfect bee hawk moth. Bee -hawk and uh, moth. here's an emperor. Ever see more exquisite markings? Well, never. Uh, tell me, Mister Markham, when you captured a butterfly, how did you kill it without marking it in any way? With poison. Oh, what poison? Cyanide. Not arsenic. If you heard me say cyanide, Doctor. The only reason I mention it is that a friend of mine collected butterflies once, and I'm certain that he always used arsenic to kill them. Why do you keep talking of arsenic? Are you trying to hint at something? Oh, no, no, my dear fellow. I was just curious, that's all. Yes. A trifle too curious, perhaps. Huh, there's the luncheon gong. Let's go downstairs again. Ah, uh, so, we? man, uh... I didn't mean to offend you. Oh, of course you didn't. But my nerves are a little on edge today. It must be that accident to your friend that's upset him. I really must get that balcony rail mended. Shh. Shh. What is it, sir? My wife. Young Rome. Look at me to lunch. Listen. Darling, why won't you understand? Oh, but you get me to you. Jeffrey has no imagination. He's never understood you. Well, Doctor, they say that listeners never hear good of themselves. You know, sometimes I wonder... My wife wouldn't like me out of the way. Now, let's go down to lunch, shall we? And 
so, Holmes, that's the story up to now. A very interesting one, too, Watson. So you think that uh, Mrs. Markham is planning to kill her husband, eh? Oh, it's obvious. She's in love with the actor fuller, Dennis Romney. Her husband's in the way, and if she doesn't want to use poison this time, there's a, a perfect setting for murder in that crumbling balustrade on the landing. Mm -hmm. One push when he wasn't looking, and it'd be the end of him. And one could prove that she did it. A charming household. And Mr. Markham became very evasive, you say, when you mentioned arsenic. Yes. I said it deliberately, of course, to see how he'd react. If you ask me, he knows that his wife has arsenic of the house. He was trying to protect her. You've exerted your charm sufficiently to arrange to see them again, I trust. Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I have. They're taking a picnic tea and going boating on the Avon this afternoon. They asked me to join them. Of course, I agreed. I just rushed back here to the hospital to... Talk to you first. You've done splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Oh, thank you, Mr. Well, uh, but uh, I've been so busy mm. telling you what I've found out that I haven't asked you about you. Um, uh, uh, I feel oh, it. I'm fine, old fellow, fine. Uh, what did the house surgeon discover? A very interesting fact. Look in the drawer beside my bed, will you? Great Scott, it's a bullet. A bullet that the house surgeon removed from my shoulder. But, but we found a bullet in the tree also. Precisely. Therefore, two bullets were fired. But, good Lord, that means... It means, old chap, that we have a dangerous task ahead of us. Not to solve a murder, but to prevent one. And now, Dr. Watson, what happened next? We left you at Sherlock Holmes' bedside in the hospital. Did the picnic with Mr. and Mrs. Markham prove an exciting one? No, no, it was rather unpleasant, as a matter of fact. The three of them kept squabbling all the time, and... Just as we were coming home, something unforeseen occurred. Mr. Markham fell into the river. Well, pardon the old question, Doctor, but uh, did he fall or was he pushed? It was hard for me to say. I had my back to him when he fell. Uh, of course, we fished him out and rattled him back home in a trap as fast as we could. He changed his clothes at once. And as we sat around the fire a little later, I could see that he caught a chill. In fact, I recommended that he go to bed and stay there. Mrs. Markham agreed with that. I do wish you'd follow Dr. Watson's advice and go to bed. For the fifth time, Alice, I will not go to bed. I'm perfectly all right. No, it's no thanks to you and Dennis. What do you mean by that remark, Geoffrey? You know perfectly well what I mean. It wasn't an accident that I fell in the river just now. One of you two pushed me when I was struggling with the punt pole in the long reeds. Geoffrey, you're talking rubbish. Am I? You were in the boat, Dr. Watson. Didn't you say? No, I didn't say. My back was turned to you when you fell in. Oh, well, then we'll call it an accident. An accident that happened by a curious coincidence, just where the river is deepest and the reeds thickest. Jeffrey, I don't like your tone. You can accuse me of anything you like, but when you start suggesting that if Alice... If you don't like the way I talk to my wife, I suggest that you don't come to my house. I'm going to get a scarf, I'm chilly. <sighs> Dr. Watson, I, I must apologize for my husband's behavior. I don't know what's come over. Oh, him. that's quite all right, Mr. Markham. I quite understand. Well, I wish I did. I, I don't mind yelling at me, but... He's being so abominably rude to you, Alice. The last couple of weeks, it's been getting worse than ever. I know. Ever since we had that argument about the insurance policies, he's been unbearable. Insurance? Yes, Doctor. We took out quite large policies on each other's lives recently. You, you didn't tell me that, Alice. Well, it, it was his idea. And yet when the insurance came here, you'd have thought I was forcing him into taking out the policy. Insurance? Great Scott, I... I... You what, Doctor? Are you? Oh, nothing, Mr. Markham. No, 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 nothing at all. Sounds as if you don't approve of insurance, sir. Oh, it's not that, Romney. I, it's just that I... Who can that oh. be? I wasn't expecting anyone. Answer the door, Dennis, will you? Yes. Oh, sounds yes. as if Jeffrey's has already done so. Oh, uh, Alice, we have a visitor. Holmes, you shouldn't be up. Good evening, Mrs. Markham. Hello, Watson. Well, uh, I'm delighted to see you, Mr. Holmes. So I understood from your friend that you'd be in the hospital for several days. The constitution of an ox and the obstinacy of a mule, two characteristics of mine, have combined in making possible an early departure from the hospital. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Romney? I think I've seen you at the theatre. My name is Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, sir? You'll stay to supper, I hope. If it's not inconvenient, Mrs. Markham. Of course it isn't. I'll go in and arrange for it. Upon my soul, Holmes, I, I'm glad to see you. And are you, old fellow? Let's take a stroll on the terrace, shall we? It's rather warm inside this evening. You can go out through the French windows. Oh, thank you, Mr. Markham. Holmes, are you quite sure that you're well enough to go walking about? Of course I am. You must tell me, Watson, what the latest developments are. In the meantime, I myself have not been idle. Yes, Watson, I think our stage is set, and I have a feeling that I may contribute to a rather dramatic last act curtain. Oh, 
<laughs> a delightful meal, Mrs. Markham. Well, well, thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're not eating very much. My appetite is a trifle jaded. The mental fencing that we have indulged in during the meal has been somewhat disturbing. I don't understand you. Oh, come now, madam. I know that you were once Mrs. Dangerfield, and you know that I know it. Why keep up the pretense any longer? Very well, Mr. Holmes. But we can converse in lowered voices. I'm sure that you've told Dr. Watson whatever there is to know, and perhaps more. I admire your courage, madam. Jeffrey, Dennis. Yes, sir. I want you to listen to this. Mr. Sherlock Holmes knows that I was once Mrs. Dangerfield. He's apparently under the impression that this is a dark secret of mine. Mr. Holmes, Geoffrey knew and loved me before I ever married Mr. Dangerfield. Of course I did, Holmes. He stood by me during the horrible trial after my first husband's death, and I told Dennis about the whole miserable business months ago. So I really don't see that you've uncovered any great secrets. Not yet, Mrs. Markham, but I have a feeling that it's only a matter of moments. So you haven't got any secrets from Dennis either, eh? There's no need to shout, Geoffrey. There's no need for Dennis to be in my house. Get out, Romney, and stay out. This business between you and Alice has gone far enough. I'll go when Alice tells me to. Well, if you won't go, then I'm not going to sit here. I'm... I'm going upstairs. You're shaking like a leaf, sir. You've got a fever. Don't you think you'd better go to bed? Mind your own business. Leave me alone. Uh, Mrs. Markham, I really think you should persuade your husband to go upstairs and lie down. Don't worry, Mr. Holmes. I know how to handle him. I'll take him up. Put an arm around my shoulder, Geoffrey. Come along. We should follow them, Holmes. They have to pass that crumbling banister on the landing. With him in that state, she, she might try to... What are you suggesting, Shh. Doctor? Come and watch, both of you. We can observe them both from the foot of the stairs here. They're on the landing. She's on the outside. Look, 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 look. Markham stumbled against her. He's pushed her against the railings. Look out! Everybody, Come on, there's the stairs! Oh! Alice, are you all right? Yes, but Jeffrey tried to push me through the railing. That's a lot. No, it isn't, sir. The three of us were watching it from below. But the railing held. I, I don't understand. I can explain that, Watson. This afternoon, while you were all at your picnic, I came here with a local carpenter. You had informed me, old fellow, that it was the maid's day off, and I took the liberty of reinforcing that decaying woodwork. What the blazes do you think you've been up to, Holmes? Preventing murder, sir, and finding the true solution to the Dangerfield case. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? The true solution? Surely it's obvious to you, Mrs. Markham. You have told us that your present husband loved you before you married Mr. Dangerfield. It was he who accidentally killed your uncle so that you might inherit a fortune. It was he who accidentally gave your first husband an overdose of arsenic. Arsenic that he obtained for the purpose of destroying butterflies. Yes, yes, and it was he who tried to send you to your death by pushing you through those railings. And all the time, Mrs. Markham, I thought that you were the potential murderer. You fellows have got hold of the wrong end of the stick. All I've been trying to do is to... That my wife was a murderess. Jeffrey, how can you say that? Markham, it's weird. Just a moment, Mr. Romney. I'm not through with him yet. This talk is all very dramatic, Mr. Holmes, but I wonder how you're going to be able to prove it. Dr. Watson, Mr. Romney and I will testify to the attempt that you've just made on Mrs. Markham's life. Yes, and what about the attempt on your life, Holmes? Obviously, it was Markham who fired at you in the woods. But my wife has already admitted firing the shot. Uh, true, sir. But two shots were fired. The one that your wife fired, we found in the tree. The one that you fired was extracted from my shoulder in the hospital. Then the two shots were fired simultaneously. You remember, Watson, that I commented at the time on a curious echo. Mrs. Markham told us that her arm was jolted as she pulled the trigger. That was when the other rifle was fired. Mr. Markham didn't want me on the scene when he staged his latest accident, and so he tried to kill me. What kind of a devil have I been living with all these years? I think I'm going to kill you, Markham. Don't come near me. Keep him away from me. Uh, leave him to the law courts, Mr. Romney. British justice may be slow, as indeed it was in the Dangerfield case. But in run, it is sure. Find that out, Mr. Markham, on the gallows. Well, tell me, did, did Mr. Markham finally end on the gallows? Yes, he did. And it might interest you to know that Mrs. Markham and Dennis Romney were married. A nice chap and a... And a fine actor, that boy. Hmm. Maybe that's what I should have been. An actor. Hmm? To be or not to be, that is the question. It is noble <coughs> in the mind to suffer. <coughs> well, what's the matter, Doctor? Don't you like it? The words are beautiful, but the your delivery of them... Uh... Not good, huh? No, not good, Mr. Barno. Okay. I'd rather talk about Petri wine anyway. Now, there's something to really talk about. Petri wine. A wine with generations of winemaking behind it. That's a fact, you know. The Petri family started making Petri wine generations ago. 
well, way back in the 1800s. So they've had the time to develop the art of winemaking, and they've been able to hand down that art from father to son, from father to son. Yes, the Petri family really knows how to turn luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. And those letters, P-E-T-R-I on the bottle, are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of Petri wine is good wine. It's got to be. Because don't forget, Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an exciting adventure Holmes and I had in North Africa. It begins at the headquarters of the Foreign Legion and ends with a strange death in the cafe of a thousand sighs. I call the story Murder in the Casper. Murder in the Casper. 